Welcome to the Ron Paul Liberty Report. This report is coming from Angleton, Texas at the Mises Symposium. So I welcome everybody to the Liberty Report. And for our viewers, our co-host, surprisingly enough, is Daniel McAdams. <laughs> How are you this morning, Dr. Paul? Good, and Daniel has all kinds of surprises because he hasn't told me what our program is about yet. <laughs> Didn't you hear your phone ringing during our break? <laughs> I kept calling you. But you know, there's a lot of days when we do our report that we don't know a whole lot before. He's, he's getting so professional. Now he keeps his computer open. He says, oh, there's a news flash here, right in the middle of the program. So, so he does keep up. There wouldn't be much of a report there if it didn't have Daniel there keeping it going. But of course, it wouldn't exist if we didn't have viewers tuning in. And I might ask Daniel to do a little bit of reporting on numbers, but you know, our numbers are very, very good. Uh, in, a, in a way, it's sort of a mixed blessing. The numbers have skyrocketed recently because of the corruption in the country, and they want to hear something about how we're going to get rid of it. But we do have a larger audience right now than ever before. And... <laughs> And something that we didn't have at the beginning is we didn't have live streaming. Uh, th those were some of the terms I had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> but I know what it is now, and it started off. I think, Daniel, it might be uh, something like, we had 100 or so people tuning in for live streaming. And now Daniel will update us on that because I think our numbers are growing. And, uh, and I found, found out that if you live stream, you can communicate with other people who are live streaming. And uh, sometimes they go back and forth and there's a little bit of excitement and we pay attention to it. It's, it's pretty neat that we can get feedback like that. But Daniel, why don't you give us a little update on uh, how long have we been doing this and what are the numbers doing and uh, and, uh, and how, how, how many do we have now and how many are we going to have next year? Well, we got really excited early on. This was in 2015 in the spring when we had 60 live viewers. And it was, <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. And, and the, one of the things, Dr. Paul, as you know, the, the, the real measure of success, the, the main thing we wanted to achieve with the show uh, is that when something happens, people want to turn to us and turn to you for your take on it and, and we find that happens over and over again. You know, when President Trump fired a few missiles into Syria, well, we had a big day because people wanted to know what did Ron Paul think about it? What did the Ron Paul Institute think about it? And we've learned from this, this past week, well, certainly these past few months, our numbers on the coronavirus have skyrocketed. People want to know, they're hungry for an alternative view. But as Professor Reptinwald pointed out, and, and we, should make no, we should make no bones about it, uh, we have had a show yanked temporarily. There was a little bit of an uproar, and we don't know why, but they put it back up. Um, but we operate under the assumption that any show can be canceled by the mainstream media, by the YouTube, by the Google, by the CIA, as we now know. Um, and so it does constrain, and we just had a conversation on, on Thursday, Dr. Paul, when we put out a title and we were looking at it, and we thought, you know, it could get us a lot of viewers, but we might want to soften it. And it's terrible doing this because this is what they did uh, in communism. This is what they did in communist countries, uh, self-censorship. So it's a problem we face because we want to grow our viewership. We want to do it with snappy titles. We don't want to have, you know, uh, some boring title. But we also realize that there are risks involved uh, with, with trying to do that. You know, m many people know the story that I got interested in politics, not because I was interested in being in politics or in office, but mainly to have a forum talking about things that I thought were important. And that was in the early uh, 1970s. And of course, there was a big issue of money, monetary policy and the gold standard in Bretton Woods. And that uh, got me motivated. But, and I spent a lot of time on that issue and continue to spend a lot of time uh, on that issue. And, uh, I got on the Financial Services Banking Committee very early on and was always on the Banking Committee. And uh, yet, <clears throat> as, as time went on, uh, foreign policy became a, a bigger issue too, and a big issue. So I think <clears throat> probably my time is split, but we are also directed by uh, current, uh, current events. And right now, you, you know, we, we uh, we, we talk about monetary policy, we talk about the budget, we spend more time 
on a on a Liberty Report uh, uh, on on Fridays on econ on economic events, but uh, I re I remember early on uh, in the in the debates uh, presidential debates, it was announced that uh, this week uh, we were you know going to do economics and. And then the next week they say, well, we did economics last week. This week we're going to talk about foreign policy. And I always thought, that's a dumb statement. <laughs> you know, how, how do you separate the two? Can you talk about foreign policy over here and talk about sanctions and protectionism and interference and war profiteering and all these things and say it has no economic uh, impact? It has a tremendous amount of impact. Well, current events have driven us here in the last uh, several months, uh, obviously, to talk about uh, our, uh, our our problem with getting people to <coughs> under <coughs> excuse me to understand what coronavirus isn't, and uh, we've been working on that. And uh, of course, uh, that invites other things. That invites uh, you you know civil liberties. That is a big big deal because uh, it's a violation. But so does foreign policy involve the violations of, of civil liberties. So it's, it's, a, um, it's, 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 it's a show that uh, we put on and people are interested. I'm delighted that we have some people interested. But when uh, some people say, well, you have $250,000, but we have 2 million people watching our station. Yeah, I know, but they don't even know what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, will, I argue that uh, we have good numbers. Uh, and we go for quality. I'm glad to be here today with all of you. <laughs> now, Dr. Paul, one of the things that we've been following, and I noticed when I got to your house last night before our dinner that the, uh, the TV was on and you were watching the numbers come in and you were watching what happened. I know in your talk, you're gonna talk about does, does voting matter, is it even a, isn't even a point, but we haven't talked about this before, but I was gonna ask you, I know you were watching the news this morning. I know you were following things this morning. What, uh, what are the things you're seeing about the, the, the election and uh, what are your thoughts at the moment? Same old stuff. <laughs> <clears throat> no, no, nothing dramatic. <clears throat> the lying continues and that is, uh, this is all about lying and who, who are the best liars? Who's the biggest demagogue? But that's been a around for a long time. But, it, but it's also, it's constantly uh, reinforcing this concern. Who are the police? You know, who, who's supposed to police all this stuff? And the police, I remember as a kid, the, the, it would be brought to our attention, boy, you don't want a crooked cop. Crooked police, they're terrible, they're, they're evil people. But we have a crooked police force in this country. When you think about, uh, you know, uh, how powerful has the mafia been along? They have their police connection, there's bribery. How much, how much uh, uh, abuse of the police departments have occurred with the drug war and it goes on and <clears throat> so you so you have a, a system now that's very very much involved like never before involved in our elections and uh, we, we have the Justice Department the CIA the FBI and they've been involved in a long time but it's still it's still there it's always who 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 are the corruptors and how much power that they have I want to take, take like a, a short story about when I first went to Congress, I called somebody that was I was interested in, and some of you may remember the name of the name of Dan Smoot, and uh, he was a he was a he he belonged to the you know the right uh, the old right and which were very very libertarian. And I I can't remember exactly why I called, but uh, we we had a conversation and the subject of the CIA and the FBI came up, and he was. Uh, he, I believed he was to be a very honest person. He was, he was pro-FBI in the, in the good sense of the word. So after World War II, he was picked uh, to be in charge of finding individuals to be recommended to go to the, C, into the CIA and start this new CIA up. So he did, he took his job seriously. He had two stacks, went through all the people. Back then the scare was, is he a communist and what his beliefs were? So he had two stacks, you know, of people that he recommended. So he finally turned them over. <laughs> and uh, the, the people who were moving along to establish the, the CIA, they took, they took the wrong list on purpose. <laughs> all, the, all the people who were corrupt, 
and untrustworthy and security risk. That's who. That's how we got started. So we shouldn't be totally shocked about what we hear, and we've heard it today. The CIA is not our friend. And, and one other thing that uh, Dan Smoot told me at that time we were talking, he says, the point is, if you want to have a republic, you cannot have a CIA. It's impossible to have a republic. You know, Dr. Paul, speaking of the CIA and also speaking of how the U.S. meddles in elections overseas and has done so for decades, a lot of our troubles go back to CIA involvement in Iran in 53, as you point out many times. But, you know, trying to look for a silver lining in the fiasco, the, the, uh, the, the, the worldwide sort of embarrassment of the U.S. elections over the past week, I found a silver, you know, I'm always trying to find a good news story. <laughs> and sometimes we have to dig deep. But I actually found a good news story about this whole thing. And this, this, this is just simply this, Dr. Paul. After this election, the U.S. will never, ever again be able to lecture another country on how to hold elections. <laughs> <laughs> and listen to this. this as, may, some of you may have followed the election in Belarus in, in, uh, on August, uh, in August. Of course, the U.S. roundly condemned that election. Terrible, terrible election. In fact, I observed an election in Belarus in 2007, I think it was. It was one of the cleanest elections I've ever seen. But listen to this. This is Mike Pompeo, that great champion of democracy. Here's a statement that Mike Pompeo made about the Belarus elections. The United States is deeply concerned about the conduct of the August 9th presidential election in Belarus, which was not free and fair. <laughs> Severe restrictions on ballot access for candidates. Now get this. Prohibition of local independent observers at polling stations. <laughs> <laughs> Intimidation tactics employed against opposition candidates. Uh, they did, we, we regret that observers did not receive a timely invitation to monitor the vote. And we've all seen the, the observers in Pennsylvania were about a half a mile away with binoculars. And get this one. We strongly condemn internet shutdowns to hinder the ability of the Belarusian people to share information about the election and the demonstrations. <laughs> you they can't just, make this up. They keep reusing the same speeches of the other people. Huh? That's exactly what's been happening here over the past week. Yes, and, and, and it is true. Daniel and I work real hard at this, and sometimes the hardest job is to find that optimistic point of view, at least to mention it, because uh, obviously there are points, and, and uh, I'm always uh, amazed and sometimes surprised that with my concentration on trying to warn the people, that has to be, you know, a little scary. You know what's coming economically, you know, and... Uh, and, and you know all the weaponry buildups and all the crises that we have, that um, still uh, it, it's pretty rough living if you have no thought of a conce conceivable silver lining someplace because uh, because it, th that's the way the world has worked and and of course my point has been that uh, in the in the twentieth century which I remember pretty well uh, a lot of problems happened but horrible problems. If you add it up, uh, okay, we are 20 years into this century, but I could pick out, uh, you know, almost any 20-year period in the uh, in the 19th, in the 20th century, and it uh, our our first 20 years here is, you know, not as bad as what was going on there when they were killing millions and millions of people. You know, uh, just just think that when the election of 68 came, which was controversial and had some similarities to what was going on here, but, uh, the, you know, we elected the peace candidate to stop the war. 34,000 Americans died in Vietnam after they elected and said that Johnson, Johnson was run out of town. So uh, we still have a long way to go, but it's been pretty bad. And of course, that's why we have an institute called the Institute for Peace and Prosperity, because that's what the people deserve and that's what you support. And we know that there's a lot more people like you out there that not only would support this program, but those principles as well. So, Dr. Paul, one of the things we've touched on here today as well is the, the rise of the independent media and the, and the travails and the difficulties that we have uh, with one foot in this sort of, I would call the social media, the mainstream media, 
and, uh, and the alternative of the independent media, looking ahead for shows like ours and others who are trying to challenge the narratives, are you bullish or bearish on the ability to get a message out in an increasingly uh, restrictive world? I have to remain optimistic because, uh, you know, in one way, it's probably my lack of knowledge and understanding of exactly how the Internet works. You know, when I first did it, they told me when I was running and announced that I was going to run in 07, 08, they talked about this viral thing. And I thought, was that, is that a real virus or is that a medical term or what? No, it's, uh, I, I, I believe that there's a lot of smart people out there. There's a lot of smart people in this room that know a whole lot about the, the, the internet and spreading out messages. Just think, if our revolution could be carried by just scraps of paper passed around and, you know, uh, and written paper and they were able to achieve it, word of mouth is still very powerful. It's what the ideas that they have uh, makes the big difference. But if you have an idea whose time is coming, you have people who are ready to repeat it, uh, no, I remain optimistic. I think the answer to the trash that we get from the social media, because that's nothing but an arm of the government. So <laughs> if, we, if, if, we, if we do that, we have to use every tool possible, and, and I think that's available. And, you know, I read about them, but I don't understand that you know, how all those computers work. But I believe that the answer has to be in the competition. And, uh, and, and there's no reason why this should be permanent. You know, uh, uh, people, they, they come and go, and uh, politicians come and go, and they lose credibility. And I think uh, uh, hopefully very soon the social media lose, loses this dictatorship that they have. They have total control. But I know a lot of people are sick and tired of it, and a lot of people are recognizing it. And the numbers keep going up. We're up to probably about 68% of the people now don't believe what the government tells them. And that, I think, is encouraging. Well, Dr. Paul, if, you, uh, if you're about ready, I'll close it out as normal. Yes, go ahead. Give him your statement. <laughs> and then I'll tell people, come back tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the message, the real message, and it's the message to all of you, is despite the restrictions, human ingenuity will ultimately prevail. There will be a way to get around restrictions. Uh, we always try to highlight good news stories, as we've said, small victories. Uh, Dictator Newsom has gotten smacked down a little bit this past week. There have been small other other uh, court cases and things. So regardless, and this is the lesson from the Soviet world, the, the regardless of what they do, the human spirit will never die, will never give up. We just have to remember that when we feel down in the dumps, as I felt a lot this past six months. We have to remember that and reignite. And I'll tell you what, Dr. Paul, for me, visiting with people today and yesterday has really reignited my human spirit. So I'm thankful to all of you. And I'll, and I'll close our program for today by saying that ideas whose time have come cannot be stopped. And it's our job to do it, and that is why I'm here. That is why I helped to a degree to get the Mises Institute started and encouraging it very much. And that is why people like you deserve a lot of credit. And the numbers, well, you know, besides, we have a full room here. If we didn't have the clowns in Washington tell us where we can go and what we can do, if we had a bigger room, we'd have twice as many people here. So. <laughs> but I want to thank I want to thank everybody for tuning in today to the Liberty Report. Please come back soon. <laughs>